All right, folks, so today I want to take a look at the paper that introduced the idea of public key cryptography. It was published back in 1976 by Whitfield Diffie and Martin Hellman. Hellman was a professor at Stanford at the time, and Diffie was his grad student. And they were awarded the Turing Prize back in 2015 for this very fundamental contribution. Indeed, the modern secure internet as we know it would not have been possible without the idea of public key cryptography. Now, the first practical implementation was actually invented by Rivest, Shamir, and Adelson, who created the RSA encryption algorithm, and they were awarded the Turing Prize back in 2002. So cryptography at the time suffered from one fundamental problem, which was that two parties that wanted to privately communicate needed to have shared a secret key in advance. And this key exchange would have had to happen via some other mechanism, like a courier or registered mail or meeting in person. And once this key had been shared, they could then send encrypted messages back and forth to each other. Obviously, in situations where you want to do this with people you might not have yet met, this is impractical. You cannot wait until you can first securely exchange a key. What the authors are proposing here is a public key crypto system, where instead of one secret key, you have two distinct keys, E and D, where E is used for encrypting messages and D is used for decrypting messages. And the keys are chosen such that computing the decrypting key D from E is computationally infeasible. What this means is that the key used for encryption can be made public. And this really is the central groundbreaking idea of this paper. What does this imply? This implies that if I know your public key, which is also your encrypting key, I can use that key to encrypt a message to you such that only you can decrypt that message with your decrypting key. And this solves the problem of having to share a secret key beforehand because anyone can look up anyone else's public key, whether you know them or not, and then establish a secure communication channel with that person. The other central contribution of this paper is to propose a public key distribution system. The idea here is that once again, two people who do not share a secret key that they have exchanged in advance want to arrive at a secret key. So they will communicate back and forth until they arrive at a key in common. And the property of the system is that even someone who has observed all the communication back and forth between those two parties cannot use that information to derive the secret key that both parties share at the end of that process. The other problem this paper looks at is the problem of producing digital signatures. We want these digital signatures to have the same properties as written signatures on paper documents, which is to say that only the owner of the signature could have produced that signature and it is attached to a specific document. In other words, a digital signature proves the authenticity of a document and it can be checked by anyone to verify that authenticity. Next, the authors look at the notion of security of a crypto system and the types of attacks that can be mounted on one. A crypto system that requires an infeasibly large amount of storage or computation to break, but which could be broken with unlimited computation is called computationally secure. A crypto system which cannot be broken even with unlimited computation is called unconditionally secure. Now, the latter is impractical to achieve. In fact, the only unconditionally secure system known is the one-time pad in which the length of the key is exactly the same as the length of the message. 
and the key is randomly generated. Now let's look at the types of attacks one could mount on a crypto system in order to break it. In increasing order of strength, these are a ciphertext only attack where the attacker only knows the ciphertext, a known plain text attack in which an attacker possesses a decent number of plain text and ciphertext pairs. And the strongest one is a chosen plain text attack in which an attacker can craft plain text messages and then see what the corresponding ciphertext for them is. Now we come to the part of the paper that lays out the ideas for public key cryptography. As we saw, the major limitation of existing crypto systems at the time was that you had to have shared a private key before communicating. And this is not always a practical thing to achieve. In fact, if you have N people who would like to communicate with each other, you have order of N squared potential pairs who might want to communicate privately with each other. And it is completely unrealistic to assume that each of those N squared pairs will wait for the fortuitous circumstances that will allow them to share a secret key. So in order to get over the problems of a shared key crypto system, the authors propose a public key crypto system, which given an overall key K consists of an encryption algorithm and a decryption algorithm, both of which are derived from the key K, such that encryption is the inverse of decryption. That's the standard property of a crypto system. And encryption and decryption are easy and fast to compute. And this is the important public key property, which is to say that computing the decryption key D is computationally infeasible knowing only the encryption key E. And lastly, given the key K, it is easy to compute the pair E, K, and D, K, which are the encryption and decryption keys derived from K. Because it is computationally infeasible to derive the decryption key from the encryption key, the encryption key can be made public. So like I said before, while the authors here have proposed a definition for a public key crypto system, they do not in this paper provide an actual practical implementation of this. They do provide a practical implementation of key exchange, but not of a public key crypto system. That was done by the authors of the RSA crypto system. So if we had such a system, a user would generate the keys E and D, and while keeping the decryption key D secret, they would make the encryption key E totally public. And this could be placed in a public directory along with the user's name. Anyone could then encrypt messages and send them to the user, but only the specific user could decipher those messages. Now let's look at the definition of what would later be called the Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol. The goal here is for two parties to arrive at a shared secret key while only communicating back and forth on a public channel so that anyone who has heard all the messages going back and forth between them is still not able to feasibly compute the shared secret key that each of them possess at the end. The proposed scheme rests on the difficulty of computing logarithms over a finite field. So if we have a finite field with a prime number Q of elements, and where alpha and x are members of that finite field, which is to say they are between 1 and q minus 1, computing alpha to the x modulo q is easy. However, given only the result of this exponentiation, which is y, it is very hard to then compute what x would have been. 
exponentiation is easy and fast. And if you use the famous doubling method of exponentiation, you could do it in order of log of the exponent. However, going the other way around is much more computationally intensive and is of the order of square root of q operations. So now that we know that finding logs in a finite field is hard, let's see what the actual protocol is. So alpha is a constant which is picked beforehand and then each user i randomly chooses an integer from the set 1 to q minus 1. And this random integer is kept a secret. However, alpha to the secret modulo q is made public. When this user i wants to talk to another user j, he goes and looks up yj from the public file and then computes yj to the power of xi modulo q. But remember that yj was just alpha raised to the power of j's secret, which is xj, and that is raised to the power of xi which using the laws of exponentiation is simply alpha raised to the power of xi times xj modulo q. And since this is commutative, when the user j does the exactly same thing by looking up user i's public information, that user arrives at exactly this same key. So let's look at the security of this. If Q is a prime number that can be represented in B bits, then taking logs requires on the order of 2 raised to the B by 2 operations. So if we pick a prime number that takes 200 bits to represent, computing logs modulo Q would take about 2 raised to the power of 100 operations, which is computationally infeasible. Next, the authors look at the problem of one-way authentication or digital signatures. With digital signatures, we want it to be easy for anyone to check that the signature is authentic, that only the person that claims to have produced that signature is the one who actually produced that signature, and that someone other than that person cannot produce a valid signature. And this is where the definition of a public key crypto system really shines because it can be used to very trivially and elegantly produce a digital signature. If you simply run a public key crypto system backwards, you will have produced a digital signature. So if I want to digitally sign a message M, I create the message that is the decryption of that message private decryption key. Now everyone else in the world knows my public key E and when this public encryption key E is used to decrypt the signature I just produced, they will be able to read my message but also know that only my private key could have produced that message. To end the paper, the authors look at some of the history of cryptography and they are extremely modest in evaluating their own sizable contributions in this paper and view it as a natural outgrowth of trends in cryptography stretching back hundreds of years. So what are those trends exactly? The very heart of cryptography is secrecy, but in the historical development of crypto systems, there was a lot of debate about what exactly was to be kept secret. Was it the algorithm itself? Was it the keys? It was only recently that Kirchhoff's formulated the principle that said the cryptographic system itself should be public. In other words, only the keys should be secret. Later, the bar for security was raised such that we wanted crypto systems to be able to resist known plain text attacks. This meant even old messages no longer had to be secret. Basically, over time, the portion of a crypto system which needed to be kept secret kept decreasing, and the authors view public key cryptography as a natural continuation of this trend. So that was Diffie and Hellman's paper, 
that first proposed the idea of public key cryptography and forever changed the entire field. I hope you enjoyed that and I will see you next time. Thank you very much.